Today we are going to model cell division and in particular we're going to focus first on modeling mitosis and then second at modeling meiosis. If you don't want to model both all in one sitting, you can simply set aside all of the materials for mitosis for whenever you're ready to then simulate meiosis because you will just need the same supplies. Um, you'll be doing some extra steps but you'll need the same paper, you need the chromosomes you're going to create, etc. Speaking of supplies, here is a list of what you need to gather so you'll be ready to do this exercise. For the first step, find some kind of circular object around the house to help you trace out a circle on the middle of the page. Um, the biggest thing you want to check for though is whatever size circle it is. I used a like sanitizing wipes container. Um, you want to make sure that you would be able to fit four of that size circle on your construction paper. That's the biggest thing. I mean, you can hand draw circles too if you don't have anything, um, but the wipes container worked really well for me. Now for this exercise, we're going to try to do some inquiry along the way instead of me simply telling you all exactly everything. So I want you to pause the video at different times. This will be the first time I'm asking you to do this. And if we're modeling cell division here today, I want you to take a guess at what that circle is representing. Go ahead and pause the video. If you had guessed a cell, or maybe you said the cell membrane on the outside of the cell, you're absolutely right. So this is our first cell. And what I want you to think about next is if we're going to try to make a cell divide, meaning make a copy of itself, what part inside the cell is going to be most important to us? Go ahead and pause the video. If you said the nucleus, you're absolutely right. So I want you to take another piece of construction paper, again, long ways, like horizontal, and then I want you to fold that in half, and then in half again, and then I want you to find another circular object around the house. I used a water bottle. It really doesn't matter what object it is, as long as it's smaller than the original circles you made. That's the only contingency. And quite frankly, if you don't have an object, it doesn't matter. You just need to be able to draw circles. After you trace the one circle, since you folded the paper on top of itself, you can cut it out to get four different circles. Since this is representing our nucleus, and at this point we only have one cell, you just need to place one black circle inside of your cell and set the others off to the side. And now pause a second and see if you can think what is inside of a nucleus that is so important in a eukaryotic cell. Prokaryotic cells have it, it's just not in a nucleus. So you said DNA, the genetic material, you're absolutely right. So now we're going to make some chromosomes. Now chromosomes are technically made of both DNA and protein, but of course the main thing we're interested in is the DNA inside of it. Um, but we're going to draw a chromosomal structure right now, so you're going to need to take two pieces of different color construction paper. So here I have a blue one on top of a red one. And you're going to lay them on top of each other horizontally. And then grabbing from the bottom, you're going to fold from left to right, basically in half, creasing down the middle. And then next, I want you to take one of your extra nuclei circles that you haven't used yet, stick it along one of the creases on the side, um, just so you can basically mark little sections you're going to write horizontal lines, two of them, one at the top, one at the bottom. But the point is you want them to be smaller than your nucleus circle. The point is when you next draw out and cut out the shape for chromosomes, they need to be small enough so they'll actually fit inside of the nucleus. Now we aren't actually going to use the crease side, so you can move over to the right a little bit from where you um, had the lines. And then to draw the chromosome, Probably the easiest way to do it would be to start with sort of a rounded rectangle that's up and down. So you could do two parallel lines um, going vertical and then have two horizontal lines um, connecting on either end that are smaller. And then somewhere towards the middle of your vertical lines, you can erase and put some little indentations in there. Or if it's easier, before you erase the lines, draw inward pointing triangles on either direction, but then erase the outermost section of the triangle that used to be one of the parallel vertical lines. Then cut them all out and put one of each color inside of your nucleus. The others you can leave aside for now. 
And pause the video and think to yourself, so if I've got the chromosomal structure here, is there anything within the structure of a chromosome that is particularly important to us? See if you have any idea what I'm talking about. If you said genes, that's exactly right. So you can use a ruler, or if you don't have a ruler, you can just draw straight lines as best as possible. But we're going to make segments down our chromosome structure. So we're going to make horizontal lines. How many you want, that's totally up to you. I'm just going to have two genes on the top and two genes on the bottom. But you can decide what works best for you. And when I say decide what works best for you, you're going to probably write out some letters. Not probably. This is what I want you to do. I want you to write out some letters from top to bottom. And sometimes people like to spell out a certain message. So just to make it easier to follow along, I spelled out the word love. But if you notice, there's some really particular things I want to point out. On my blue one on the left, I use a capital L, a capital O, a capital V, but a lowercase e. My red one, I use the same exact letters, but I made sure they weren't all identical in terms of upper or lowercase. And this is important because eventually when we later on um, simulate meiosis, we're going to be looking at the parental chromosomes compared to the maternal chromosomes. And I know that won't really mean much right now, but just make sure that you, if you're spelling out a message or, or if you're just writing random letters, that the letters on both chromosomes do match up. But that said, just make sure they're not all the same, either uppercase or lowercase. Mix that up a little bit. And the reason you want to mix that up a little bit is because uppercase letters are representing dominant alleles or forms of a gene, and lowercase letters are representing recessive ones. And obviously, we don't expect your both mom and dad to have the same exact forms or alleles of every single gene. So let's pretend that the L in that top gene location or locus is representing the gene that determines whether or not you have dimples. So for instance, if these are your chromosomes and the blue one was from your father and he gave a big L, well that would be dominant for dimples, but your mom gave you a little L, which would be recessive for dimples, then in this case you would have dimples because you got the heterozygous genotype or one dominant and one recessive. And you only need one copy of a dominant allele to get a dominant trait. And I should also mention that right where you made those indentations in the middle of the chromosome, for now, we'll talk about it more later what it is, but just make a kind of darkened oval that's horizontal right there in the middle of each chromosome. So now let's get back to our original setup. We've got our cell, we've got our nucleus, and now we have a couple of chromosomes inside the nucleus. But I want you to think to yourself, what is wrong with this picture in the sense that the cell is actually not ready to divide yet? Pause the video and see if you can think of what needs to happen first. If you said that the DNA needs to replicate, then you're absolutely right. So during the life cycle of a cell, there's a G1 or growth phase, the first gap, followed by synthesis or DNA synthesis when DNA is copied. After it's copied, the next step will be a final growth and preparation for cell division before it enters in to the mitotic phase, which is, consists of mitosis and cytokinesis. So we need to go through the S phase. DNA needs to replicate itself. So this is where you're going to bring those other two chromosomes you had cut out you're going to put them next to the ones of the same color, um, in the same direction, make the same lines, add the same exact letters. And again, when we say same exact letters, we also mean the version of the letters. So whatever ones are uppercase versus lowercase on the blue, make sure both blue are the same, and likewise for the red. Then take a piece of clear tape and put it across the middle of each of the two sets. So put blue with blue, red with red. The idea is when the genetic material gets copied, what's interesting is instead of just one singular rod-shaped chromosome, it becomes two conjoined in the middle at a centromere. So when it's connected, we call the two halves sister chromatids, but collectively we refer to the X-shaped structure 
as one individual chromosome. So in this case, we have two. We have the one that we did in blue, and we have the one that we did in red. Or you might have used different colors, but you get the idea. Now to get our bearings, let's put those two chromosomes back inside of the nucleus so we can visualize what's going on here. So we've got X-shaped chromosomes now instead of um, just the single set. We have basically dumped the set of genetic material to prepare for division because S during interface has happened. So let's assume G2 in interface has also happened, that the cell did some final growth and preparations for cell division, and now it's ready to divide. What do you think needs to happen in order for division to kickstart? So pause the video, think about it, and then turn the video back on. If you thought to yourself, because the chromosomes are in the nucleus, we need to get rid of the nucleus, you're absolutely right. The nucleolus, which you can't see here, is going to break down, the nuclear envelope is going to break down, and the bottom line is you are going to move that circle that represented your nucleus out of the picture, and basically now your chromosomes are free-floating in the cytoplasm. The next thing I want you to do is try to arrange the chromosomes inside of your cell in a way that you think would set them up for the cell to easily divide. There's two right ways to do this, but of course a variety of wrong ways to do it as well. So I want you to pause the video, try to set it up, and then restart the video to see how you did. One of the ways that you can correctly line them up is envisioning a an imaginary center that's horizontal and lining them up in a way that you can visualize that they would be splitting north to south eventually meaning right now we're lining them up in preparation from splitting from their sister chromatid. Another option would be to set them up so there's a vertical imaginary line in the middle like that where they would separate out east to west. And you might have had the right idea but the wrong setup so just be careful when you're looking at that imaginary line make sure sister chromatids would actually separate down their middle in a way that they get the full set of genes. So in the case of my situation, I spelled out the word love. Each new cell should get L, O, V, and E. Doesn't matter which one they get, but they need all four of those letters. So if you're setting it up wrong, you're going to get duplicate sets of either the top genes or the bottom genes. And the same would go um, in terms of, you can incorrectly do it north to south, but you can incorrectly do it east to west. For this video, I'm going to align mine so I can separate out east to west. But here's the thing. Chromosomes obviously don't have legs. I know I just had you move chromosomes around with your fingers, but really, if you can imagine each of your fingers as a long extension coming from, from an organelle called a centriole, um, there, it, there's something called spindle fibers that actually move chromosomes around the cell. So just to help us visualize this, I want you to thinly slice little sections off of the end of um, the construction paper that was like that you're just doing your drawings on. Just cut really two thin shapes off, um, thin lines I mean. And when you get those two thin lines, I want you to fold them in half and then I want you to cut them in half so then you have four different thin little spindle fibers. And I want you to actually take these spindle fibers and stick them right underneath the central area of each of the chromosomes. And in particular, I actually also want you to cut down the middle of these X-shaped chromosomes so when you're connecting these spindle fibers, you're connecting them to each of the outside as if the two on the right will go to the right and the two on the left will go to the left. Now this is because I'm splitting east to west. If we had the other arrangement, we would need to Yes, cut down the middle of the chromosomes, but we would then need to arrange the spindle fibers going up and going down because in that case we, they would be pulling them towards the north and south. But this is the arrangement for mine because I'm going east to west. And for terminology purposes, let's be clear. We have four chromosomes now. When they were conjoined at their centromere, they were called two chromosomes. Even though they had duplicated information on the left and the right, they were, as an X shape, considered a chromosome. Now that we've taken our scissors 
and cut down the middle, we're visualizing that they have turned into their own individual chromosomes. So once those spindle fibers start pulling them to opposite ends and they rip them apart at their center, center the centromere, they are no longer um, one chromosome, but now they're two but they're identical ones going to each of the two new cells. Now, because we actually had tape at the center, there's probably enough tape that when you put those spindle fibers underneath them, um, that you could literally pull them from their center, like where their kinetic core and or centromere would be. And when you're pulling them, they should be able to pull. You should be able to visualize and physically pull them with the spindle fibers. If you don't have enough stickiness or enough tape there, you can get a little extra piece of tape roll it and stick it behind to get the spindle fibers to connect from behind to, to visualize this. As you're pulling, you're probably going to notice it's going to go beyond the boundaries of the circle. So I want you to erase your circle representing your cell membrane and I want you to expand it as an oval now. So now instead of a circle, you're going to have an oval. You can remove your spindle fibers, set them off for the, to the side, and now I want you to pause the video and think if I have chromosomes on either ends of this enlarging cell, what should come next in this process of cell division? The nuclei reappear, of course. But what next? Think about what you think will occur next in cell division. Pause the video before restarting. Those cells gotta split, right? So you're, I want you to draw a line right down your oval envisioning the cytoplasm splitting. And there's an actual name for this in the mitotic phase of the cell cycle, cytokinesis. And to best realize the whole splitting into the two new cells, we can actually erase our oval with the line down the middle, pull out our whatever we use, I use a sanitizing wipe container that we use to represent the outer boundary of the cell, and we can redraw two circles and making sure we have our nuclei in each of those circles. So we can truly see we have completed cell division. Now I know we were using the same size um, as the beginning and the reality we learned in the cell cycle with an interphase there's G1, S, and G2. So G1 would be the first gap where there's growth. So technically at the end of the cell division process they're not going to be quite as big as the mature cell but you still get the idea. So this concludes the modeling of mitosis, where we started with one cell and we ended up with two identical cells with the same exact number of chromosomes in them. And the type of cells we would have been creating here is somatic cells, which are regular body cells. At this point, if you don't want to move on to the meiosis portion, save all the different pieces um, and all of your supplies so you can do meiosis at a later time. If you would like to continue in this simulation and model meiosis, then keep on watching. Uh, meiosis is a process by which we do take one cell, just like what we just did in mitosis, but instead of resulting in two identical cells, it's going to result in four non-identical cells. And in fact, they're going to have half the number of chromosomes and not identical halves of that half that they get. So this end result is going to be how sperm or egg are made um, through the meiosis process. So let's start our modeling of meiosis. I want you to flip the piece of construction paper over that you were just using to model mitosis on and use the back side to model meiosis so you don't need to erase the two new cells you just created. On the back side, Use your larger circular object to trace out a circle, but please make that cell in the upper left-hand corner, as high and as far left as possible. Now take the chromosomes you had made and tape them back together at the middle so they're looking like the X shape once again. Because if we're about to do cell division, even though a different type, they need to be in that x shaped form where the sister chromatids are identical copies to one another. Pretty sure at this point you know to put them inside of a nucleus. So put a, that circle nucleus back into your cell and add your chromosomes to it. But here's where there's some differences between mitosis and meiosis. Right now, when the chromosomes are in the nucleus, you need to line up homologous pairs. Now, here's the deal. 
we only have two chromosomes and we cut them out to be the same size, shape, and the same type of genes at the same gene loci or locations. So with this in mind, we know that the blue one and the red one or whatever two colors you used, they are homologs. They are a homologous pair. They're the same size, the same shape, and have the same type of genetic content. Even though from one parent you get a certain set of alleles or variations of those genes, and from the other parent a different set of those. Now keep in mind you have 46 chromosomes, 23 that you got from your mother and 23 you got from your father. And when I say mother and father, um, regardless of a relationship, I mean everyone came from an egg and a sperm, right? So those are the sex cells we're referring to that had chromosomes that gave you the 23 plus 23 to give you your total of 46. So when we talk about homologous pairs, for instance, you have number one from mom, number one from dad, number two from mom, number two from dad. Basically, you have 22 pairs of homologs, and then you have an additional pair of sex chromosomes that do line up during this process that we're demonstrating here in the beginning of meiosis. And when they line up next to each other, if you got an X from your father, then that means you're female because the mother can only donate an X. If you got a Y from your father, then you're like this example here where there is a Y chromosome and an X chromosome. Um, the Y and X, as you can see, are two very different sized chromosomes. Each line here is representing a chromosome. The red ones are representing the ones from mom. The blue ones are representing the ones from dad. So in our very small scale model here, we're just looking at one homologous pair and I just picked a random one. We're going to uh, decide that we're pretending this is chromosome number 16. So you're going to get one from your mother and one from your father. So we're going to imagine um, that we're following that chromosome through the process of meiosis here. So let's talk vocabulary. The physical lining up of each homolog next to the other one, meaning creating a homologous pair, that process is called synapsis. And each pair of homolog homologous chromosomes is called a tetrad. But it, that, it's not for no reason. When they line up, they may potentially and very likely will undergo a process called crossing over. So that's what we want to try to start modeling next. I want you to overlay the chromosomes kind of sideways on top of each other in a way that the innermost sides, you can almost see them interlinking and twisting around each other. Then I want you to pick a gene that you cut off on both of the innermost sides where you're envisioning them wrapping around each other. And basically the biggest thing is they have to be at the same gene locus or location. So I cut off my letter E at the bottom of those. If whatever letter you pick, just make sure that it's the same letter. Now it might not be the same version of the letter obviously because there was um, variations in terms of dominant and recessive alleles on the maternal versus paternal chromosome here, but just snip off the gene at one particular location on both chromosomes. And then you're going to simply swap which chromosome it's connected to and tape it into place on the opposite chromosome than it originated. So what we are doing when we say crossing over, they're literally swapping out genes, crossing them over to the other chromosome and forming recombinant DNA, meaning it's recombining and now those chromosomes, although they, you know, it's the same type of information, like whatever the E codes for in this case, capital E would be dominant, lowercase e recessive, for instance, but of course we're creating a new version of these chromosomes. I suggest also showing crossing over at, at least one more gene locus. So in my example here, I cut off the top L's, so I'm going to swap those around, tape them back into place on their, well, their new place when they've crossed over onto their new chromosome that they're going to attach to. The biggest thing to watch for is just make sure it's at the correct locus. Once crossing over is finished, if we think back to what happened during mitosis, if how can we move past to continue cell division, then of course the next logical step is to remove the nucleus. The nucleus is going to go away and the chromosomes are going to be floating in the cytoplasm. 
So I want you to pause the video and try to arrange the chromosomes in a way you think they need to line up. The one hint I will give you though is since the end goal of meiosis is to create four non-identical gametes or sex cells which are going to have half the number of chromosomes. This is not going to be identical, at least in this particular part of meiosis, to mitosis. There's going to be something a little bit different. But see if you can figure it out on your own first. And actually do it east to west because that will be the best way for us to set it up on our paper. Okay, so if this is wrong, but it was right in the past because we wanted to split the sister chromatids, how could we possibly set this up during this process of meiosis? The key thing you actually need to know is that during meiosis, there are two sets of division. So in this first setup, you actually envision the imaginary line down the middle of the cell and you put homologs on either side of it. So you have to set up all the homologous pairs. Now, of course, we've already said in the past, we're only using one, but there'll be 23 sets of homologous pairs, or we, you know, technically the 22 plus the sex chromosomes, and they're going to line up next to each other, one on one side of that midline and one on the other side. Because in this process, the X-shaped chromosomes will be separated from each other initially before later on the actual X's have their sister chromatids separate. Though just like in mitosis, we know chromosomes do not have legs, so they need to be moved by spindle fibers. So pull out your thin pieces of construction paper spindle fibers, put them underneath each chromosome, and I want you to visualize that the center of each chromosome where your centromere is, um, and I've tried to kind of highlight that with a green and black um, round section in the center, I want you to visualize these spindle fibers pulling from that exact um, center area of each chromosome so each of the homologs will go in either direction towards each of what would eventually be in a little bit here two new cells. Now if you don't have enough stickiness underneath your X-shaped chromosomes to attach the spindle fibers to physically pull them um, then you can just add a little tape roll if needed. Then physically pull those homologs away from each other using the spindle fibers and you will see that obviously the cell is growing, so you need to um, make your cell turn into an oval instead of a circle, so you can extend the lines and then erase your circle and just have the oval, new, growing, larger cell. Now the nuclei should reappear, so put those circles back and make sure your chromosomes are inside of them. Model a little cytokinesis by drawing a line down the center of the cell. And then to really show that they've split just erase the oval and the center line. Use your large circular object to retrace, um, or I should say to trace now in this case because you don't have anything on your paper because you just erased everything. In the top left and top right corners, draw two new cells and put your nuclei with the associated chromosome inside. But why aren't we done yet? So you know that I'm not doing a, hey, we just finished meiosis kind of statement. So I want you to pause the video and think to yourself, what is wrong with these two cells? What is the reason why this process of meiosis is not yet finished? If you said it's because the chromosomes are X-shaped, you're absolutely right. So the issue is, although the homologs have separated from one another, these chromosomes that are inside of the two new cells, they're basically duplicated chromosomes connected at a centromere. So we need to go through a second set of cell division. So meiosis has a first set and a second set, first time making two cells, and then taking those two cells and splitting both of them, so we're going to end up with four cells. As always, we need to get rid of nuclei if we want to get chromosomes moving around. And once you have taken those circles, Away, I want you to see if you can figure out how to align each chromosome in each cell so that way they will properly divide. But again, this is happening in two different cells this time, 
Um, so you have to arrange them in both cells separately. Hopefully you figured out that you line them up in the middle basically in the same way you did during mitosis. The only difference is that there's half the number of chromosomes now. So when we modeled mitosis earlier, we used two chromosomes um, as because that's just the sample number we're using. Now we're using one. I'm going to ask that you align it north to south, regardless of how you had set it up. And that is because we already have two cells drawn at the top of our sheet of paper. And so as we grow and envision the two new cells, we're going to open them up um, to extend down on the page. Pull out those spindle fibers again. Since we know chromosomes don't have legs, affix them to the back side. But be careful because in this case, you need a spindle fiber on either side of the chromosome because the sister chromatids are going to be separated into individual chromosomes. And then as we envision the spindle fibers pulling from the center of each half, each sister chromatid at that middle centromere, as they're being pulled apart, take your scissors and cut straight down the middle to separate those sister chromatids into those separate chromosomes. Then you know the drill as they're being pulled, as we pull those chromosomes to opposite ends, erase your circles, replace with ovals, because you have a two, in this case, growing cells. Then no need for those spindle fibers anymore, but now we have four different chromosomes. I mean, obviously, in your real body, it'd be 23 in each of these corners, but you need to add back in four nuclei because each of those, in our case, just one chromosome, needs its own nucleus. Now we've got to envision both of those cells having a cytokinesis step so we can result in four new cells. So when that happens, just like we've been doing, you're going to erase your ovals, erase your lines of where they separated out, and use your tool, once again, whatever you use for the larger rounded shape for the cell border, the cell membrane, draw four new cells, make sure they each have their own nucleus with their own chromosome inside, which if you notice, it's not only that half the number of chromosomes have resulted in these four new cells, but they also are not identical to one another. This was especially because of, I mean, not just the having step and the fact that a person has maternal and paternal chromosomes of their set and you're only going to get one in each of the new sex cells, but it's also because of that crossing over step that we had at the very beginning of this process. This helps ensure genetic variability. And keep in mind, a sex cell is either a sperm or an egg. So you've got two different people going through the same exact process which results in a variety of sperm and a variety of eggs that are produced by each of them with their chromosomes from their own parents that when those two people reproduce together, um, you know, we get a lot of different options for what those babies could look like. And that's it. We have finished modeling meiosis. And I just want to give a little shout out to the University of Pittsburgh's bio outreach program. Um, years, like many years ago, I had the opportunity to attend one of their summer trainings. And from that, that opened up access for me to be able to utilize lab kits they've designed in my classroom. One of those lab kits was a mitosis simulation, full class simulation, lots of movement, lots of fun. I modified it and used it over the years, which eventually led me to this individual, like this, what you see right here, this construction paper, um, one person can do it at their desk exercise. So if you don't know about PIT Bio Outreach, especially if you live in Western Pennsylvania, I definitely recommend you checking them out. Construction paper biology. Like, share, subscribe, oh, won't you please? Thanks!